Thank you very much, Ian. Hello and welcome to the Customer Experience Opportunity and Challenges webinar with our host, Ian Golding. Thank you very much to all of you from all over the world who are participating today. Uh, this is the first of a number of uh, online events that will be taking place over the next few months. Uh, next month, we will also be hosting an online training program, which would be a one day take of Ian's traditional two day masterclass, which will be entirely delivered online, along with a CCXP readiness workshop. And we have a specific Brazilian version of the CX Masterclass, which will be run on the 5th of May, and our first ever Transatlantic Masterclass with Diane Majors alongside Ian Golding. So I'd like to pass you over to my host for today, which is Ian Golding. Some of you already know him very well. Uh, so Ian, please take it from here. Thank you very much. Hello. Ladies and gentlemen, wherever you happen to be joining us around the world, I am so grateful for you for taking the time to listen to some very important thoughts around the subject of customer experience that are very important at any time, um, let alone when we are all being uh, very severely affected by a global crisis, as we all know. Um, so uh, I just am going to uh, very quickly share my screen. Um, if I could just ask the Arquet Global team to give me permission to do so, that would be great. Um, and I am very hopeful that everyone that is online can now see the screen in front of them. So to join me. Um, I am going to take you through a number of things today. I'm going to share some global best practice theory with you all. Um, very important theory to just provide the context for what we're going to be talking about for the remainder of the session. I'm going to be talking to you about the role of leadership the role of leadership in creating a sustainably customer-centric organization. This, as I say, is important at any time, but it becomes even more important in the current times that we are currently facing. I'm going to talk to you about the importance of having a structured and rigorous approach to making the management of customer experience intentional. And I'm going to share with you the competencies that are required by any organization if they want to become sustainably customer centric. The next two hours are not just going to be about me sharing knowledge with you, it is also going to provide you with a couple of opportunities to look towards yourselves and not just yourselves, but your own organizations. Because I'm going to ask you to participate in not one, but two self-assessment exercises. I'm going to ask you to think about how well your leaders are behaving as customer centric leaders. And I'm going to ask you to conduct a self assessment, a self assessment of how customer centric you believe your own organization to be. So the next two hours are a combination of me sharing knowledge, you assessing yourselves, but also you asking questions. It is extremely important that you do feel able to ask as many questions as you would like to as we go through the session. So now I have set the scene. I think what I'm going to do is to um, move straight into a little bit of theory. And I don't want to overdo the theory because much of what I'm about to share with you 
is not what I would describe as rocket science, but it is very important that we are able to ensure that when we talk about the subject of customer experience, that we are all talking about the same thing. So I want to share just a few very important elements of theory that will provide us with the grounding for the remainder of the session today. The first thing I would like to clarify is language. The world has become very excited in its creation of terminologies to describe the relationship with the customer. The three terminologies you see on the screen are the three most commonly used terms to describe the relationship with the customer. Customer service, customer experience, and customer centricity. But they are not the only terms. Some organizations talk about customer excellence, some talk about customer happiness, some talk about customer success. There are many terminologies, and the fact that there are many is not an issue. What is an issue is the fact that it is not uncommon for leaders within an organization to use these terminologies interchangeably with each other, thinking that they mean the same thing, and they do not mean the same thing. Customer service, for example, is not the same thing as customer experience. It is astonishing how many leaders think that it is the same thing. Customer service is only one element of the experience that an organization delivers to its customers. In exactly the same way as sales is, as marketing is, as operations is, as everything is. Everything an organization does that enables the delivery of the product or service to the customer contributes to the customer experience. Whether individuals in your organizations know it or not, every single person that works within your organization contributes to the delivery of the experience in some way, even if they never actually meet or face a customer. It is quite ironic that customer experience in the world we live in today is still relatively new as a business concept. I say relatively new because customer experience has only really come to the fore in the last five to 10 years or so. The reason it's ironic is that customer experience should have been something at the top of business leaders' minds from the beginning of time, because every organization on earth was delivering an experience the day it was created. It is only in recent times that businesses have become consciously aware of that fact. And so it's very important that we're able to be clear that recognizing the experience is important, but just recognizing it does not make an organization customer centric. For an organization to become customer centric, it is something completely different altogether because it would essentially mean that the experience is able to be delivered in an organization that has empowered its people to think and act in the interests of the customer every time it does anything. Just have a think about that for a second. To be a customer-centric organization would mean that your people are able to think and act in the interests of the customer every time they do anything. And in the current circumstances that the world finds itself in, in a global pandemic where many people are scared, are fearful of the future, are under great deals of stress, the need to be a customer-centric organization has become even more important. 
because if we are not able to think and act in the interests of the customer, then we will not be able to empathize with our customers and leave them feeling the way we want them to feel. That being said, it is important that as leaders, we understand what it is that we need to do to improve the experience that we want our people to deliver. All experiences are made up of these three component parts, the functional, the accessible, and the emotional. The functional component of all experiences represents your products or your services. This historically is the only one of the three components that customers have taken as given. They just expect your products or services to do what you say they are going to do, which is why in the world we live in today, it has become extremely difficult, if not impossible, for an organization to differentiate itself on that functional component alone. Because the only way that you can differentiate on the functional component today is if your product or service is completely unique. In other words, no one else does it. And there are very few organizations on earth today who are offering a product or service that is completely unique. For example, I do a lot of work in Dubai. Dubai has 54 banks that all do exactly the same thing, essentially. It is impossible for those banks to differentiate themselves on their products and services alone. And it's why the accessible component is becoming ever more important. How easy is it for your customer to interact with your products and services? The accessible component is one of the reasons why the digital um, obsession that the world is currently working its way through has become so prevalent because digital technology has made it easier for organizations to provide access to products and services. And the organization who has reaped the benefits of that more than any other is Amazon. And what's fascinating about Amazon as an organization is that their uniqueness has very little to do with products and services because they sell exactly the same stuff as everyone else. It is the fact they've made it so easy to access that stuff that is what is differentiating Amazon from other retailers around the world. But whilst we cannot have an experience without the functional or the accessible, it is the third component that is the most important of the three. And again, during this global pandemic, this component is even more important than ever before, because the third component is the emotional one. The emotional component representing the way an experience makes us feel. And the reason why that emotional component is the most important of the three is because the way an experience makes us feel is what we are most likely to remember. And from all experiences we have, we as consumers, as customers, will remember one of three things. We will remember very good things. We will remember very bad things. Or we will remember nothing at all. And it is actually that third outcome that typically is the worst of the three. But again, in the current circumstances we find ourselves in, any organization that leaves a customer feeling the wrong way, remembering them for the wrong reason right now, could severely suffer consequences once this pandemic comes to an end. 
there are already an increasing number of organizations who are being remembered for behaving in a very negative way as this crisis worsens, increasing their prices, sticking to arduous terms and conditions. Your customers will not forget that. It is so critically important that we as of organizations are conscious about the way we want our customers to feel and that we are very conscious that our customers are remembering us for the right reason. So if I take this a step further, what do we want the experience to be in the first place? Every organization on the planet sits somewhere on what I call the customer experience continuum. The most customer centric organizations in the world sit on the right hand side of the continuum, delivering truly differentiated experiences. Less customer centric organizations sit on the left hand side of the continuum, delivering what we call random or unexpected experiences. And re regrettably, the overwhelming majority of organizations on earth are on the left hand side of this. They deliver random or unexpected experiences because they deliver experiences that for us, the customer, very often feel as though we never quite know what's going to happen. And I tend to use the example of telcos. Um, unfair of me to always pick the telco industry, but they are a good example, regrettably, of one that in the main is currently delivering random experiences. If you contact a telco three times in one day, the likelihood is the experience that you have could be different on each of those occasions. And why is that happening? And just to be clear, all industries potentially are like this, not just telcos. The reason comes back to the fact that most organizations were not created to differentiate on the experience. They were created to differentiate on their products or services. And as a result, many people within these organizations are so focused on tasks, processes, and products that they are not thinking beyond the millions of KPIs, millions is a slight exaggeration, that they are being measured on. Because businesses are so obsessed with measuring the stuff that people are doing, that that means that they are not able to think beyond the task, beyond the process they've been asked to perform. And because of that, very often, they perform tasks and processes that don't even feel normal. In fact, what they're doing is acting on things that shouldn't be normal. What I mean by that is, even when things go wrong, we start measuring the things going wrong rather than preventing them from going wrong in the first place. And that's why it's also ironic that customer experience is still something that many professionals around the world are fighting to get focus on because we also live in a world of austerity. And again, in the current environment, the focus on cost is going to become even more extreme. One of the ironies about only now focusing on customer experience is that the biggest source of wasted cost in most organizations today is down to the fact that they are delivering random experiences in the first place. Every time something goes wrong, it costs money. Every time a customer contacts you unnecessarily, it costs money. If we just focused on eliminating the randomness in the experience, organizations would save a fortune. On the right hand side of the continuum, as I said, sit the most customer centric organizations in the world. These are organizations that when they were created, 
made the definitive decision to differentiate themselves, not just on their products and services, but on the whole experience, on everything they do. These are the Amazons, the Disneys, the Ritz Carltons, organizations who are incredibly easy to do business with. If you, there is even a sense that your organization is not easy to interact with, then you are nowhere near hitting the right hand side of this continuum. Organizations on the right hand side are full of people who have been given the ability to think and act in the interests of the customer every time they do anything. On the left hand side, people are doing what they're told, whether it's right or wrong. Very often they won't challenge what they've been told, either because they don't think they can or because they're scared of the consequences if they do. On the right hand side, people are thinking and acting every time they do anything. And these organizations, as a result, when things go wrong, which they always will, the most customer centric organizations will stop those things from going wrong again. On the left hand side, people will be fixing the same problems repetitively over and over and over again. And on the right hand side, organizations obsess with the delivery of their brand promise. Everyone knows what the organization stands for and everyone is going in the same direction. Getting from the left hand side to the right hand side is not easy, nor should it be the priority. The priority for any legacy organization aspiring to become customer centric is not to get to the right hand side of this continuum, but to get to the middle where they would be able to define what they want the experience to be in the first place, what we call the intentional experience or the desired experience. To get to the middle of this continuum, the following characteristics must be in place. There has to be a shared vision. What that means is that customer experience is not the idea of one person, but the whole organization, supported by the whole leadership team, believes that becoming customer centric is collectively the right thing to do. People need to be given the ability to think. Giving people the ability to think when they've spent their whole career doing what they're told is easier said than done. But we need them to think even if they can't act in the way they would like to. Because transformation is not just about transforming mindset, it is also about transforming legacy processes and systems. If we can get to the middle of this continuum, there is a greater accountability when things go wrong. And additionally, we must measure not just what is important to the business, but what is important to the customer and to the employee. But the most important thing of all is that the only way we can get to the middle of this chart and beyond is through good cross functional collaboration. It is actually impossible for an organization to deliver the experience it wants its customers to have until or unless everyone, every leader, every function, every team, every employee is linking arms and working together to deliver the experience together. In these current times, Knowing what you want the experience to be is imperative. Everyone working together cross-functionally is imperative. Organizations that fail to define what they want the experience to be and that fail to work together are going to significantly struggle in sustaining their businesses beyond the current situation. And to be able to 
create this cross-functional collaboration, it is very important that there is an understanding of three fundamental layers that bring the experience together. The top layer is the customer journey. There are many organizations still who do not know what the customer journey is or looks like. That is a massive issue that needs to be addressed. And one of the reasons why continued learning in this current situation, very important. The second layer are your business processes. Business process management is not a new discipline. Most organizations on earth are fully aware of what their business processes are and look like. The problem is that many organizations created and implemented their business processes without knowing there was a customer journey. And as a result, if you try to underpin everything your people are doing today to the customer journey, which represents everything your customers interact with, there will be a misalignment. There will be people doing things that are having no impact on the customer whatsoever. And if that is the case, we have to ask ourselves, why are they doing it then? There will be processes crossing over each other. There'll be duplication. There'll be gaps where nothing's happening to the customer. All because processes were put in place without an understanding of the journey. And it gets even worse when we get to that third layer, the technology layer. Because like process, most organizations bought, designed and implemented technology without knowing there was a customer journey. And so what has happened in many organizations is that technology has been put in place, processes have been forced into it, and customers get whatever they get. If we want to deliver an experience that leaves customers feeling the way we want them to feel, we must not start with technology and work upwards. We must start with the journey and work downwards. What does the journey look like? How can we align what we do to ensure that we effectively deliver what our customer interacts with and what technology do we need that will better enable our processes to give our customers what they need. This is critically important for organizations to understand. And the final bit of theory I would like to share with you today is the importance of connecting the reason your business exists with the experience the customer has. Too many organizations over time have convinced themselves that the reason they exist is to make money. But the problem with thinking that business exists to make money is that an organization will only focus on the things important to it in making money. Those things tend to be lots of strategies, business strategy, digital strategy, corporate objectives, brand objectives, all related to things the business wants. Whilst I am not saying that is wrong, if we want to effectively connect the reason we exist with the experience the customer has, recognizing that they are having that experience whether we like it or not, we must do so by creating what I call a strategic balance. It is important to know what the business wants, but not in isolation of understanding what the customer wants. And too many organizations, whilst they have a business strategy, do not have an aligning customer strategy. Because it is only by creating that strategic balance that we can effectively connect what the business wants to what the customer experiences. And not only will that enable us to deliver better customer experiences, it will also enable us to deliver significantly better experiences for our employees at the same time. 
nothing I have shared with you, as I said at the beginning, is rocket science. None of this is complicated, but it's very important that you are able to clearly articulate the theory, the global best practice theory of customer experience to leaders in your organization. I shall pause momentarily just to see if there are any questions from the audience. I'll just have a, a quick drink while I'm uh, giving you time to think. But it doesn't appear as though we have any questions at the moment, so I shall continue. Whilst understanding the theory is vital, the most effective way of bringing that theory to life is through leadership. Leadership is absolutely essential if the aspiration of becoming a customer centric organization can even become a sense of a reality. When we talk about customer experience to leaders around the world, there are many divisions of opinion. Some leaders are absolutely brought in to the concept of customer experience and are extremely supportive from day one. There are a portion of leaders who are interested but don't quite understand what they need to do. And there is another proportion of leaders who are the skeptics, who don't believe it can make a difference, who actually think that their organization is doing customer experience already and doesn't need any help. One of the challenges in convincing leadership to the importance of customer experience is that there is a significant belief that customer experience as a concept does not make money. And if I take that a step further, there are many leaders, when you mention the word customer centric culture, will make a face because they also believe, or maybe subconsciously, that culture is a nice to have. Some will often say that culture is a little bit soft and fluffy, intangible almost. And so when I talk about the importance of leadership in creating a customer centric culture, I start by making it very clear that customer experience and customer centricity are anything but soft and fluffy. This is the output of a study conducted by Accenture. They proved that organizations displaying the attributes on the top half of this arrow deliver a significantly better financial performance than organizations displaying the attributes on the bottom half of this arrow. When I share this around the world, people will very often look at the attributes at the bottom half of the arrow and start nodding to themselves because they recognize those things. Silos, bureaucracy, stress, those are the things that most of us are very comfortable with seeing because it has become too often the norm in organizations. But what Accenture proved is that if you are displaying even one of those cultural traits at the bottom of this arrow, then you are actually in an organization whose culture is costing it money. Those things cost money. And right now, no one can afford to be in an organization where unnecessary cost is being acquired. Organizations that are learning from their experiences, that are agile, that are absolutely thinking and acting in the interests of the customer, those organizations are leaner, more efficient, and more effective. And so it's really important when you start a conversation with leaders 
to make it clear that customer centricity is all about money. It is all about creating a lean and efficient business that is better able to meet the needs and expectations of its customers. Many ask me, what if my senior executives are not interested in this subject? Can it happen? Well, my answer to that question will always be, yes, it can happen. It is not impossible without leadership. I know of many very, very capable, in fact, exceptional customer experience professionals around the world who have driven customer centric change despite the lack of support from leadership. However, if you are working within an organization where leadership are absolutely completely behind you in your efforts to become sustainably customer centric, the likelihood of that becoming a reality is much, much greater. And so I want to share a number of important leadership attributes that leaders need to be taking note of if they have a desire for their organization to ultimately differentiate itself on the experience. Once I've been through these leadership traits, I am then going to ask you to participate in a self-assessment of leadership. So just to warn you, that is coming up. The first leadership step or attribute is do your people know what you stand for in the first place? There are many leaders who are extremely good at communicating their message. But are your leaders good at communicating what they stand for? Do your people know what you stand for? Again, this is more important now than ever before. Who are you bringing into your organization? Far too many businesses continue to recruit entirely for technical ability wanting to know if you've done the job before if you um, are someone who knows how to perform the task too many organizations are still not recruiting considering the importance of attitude of what is in here And if I take that a step further, the most customer centric organizations in the world believe that the way you treat your people is the way your people will treat your customers. And as a result, many now consider employee experience to be more important in the first instance than customer experience. How are you treating your people is a very important question. For you to ask yourselves and coming back to that word of communication if you want customer centricity to live and breathe then you must constantly remind people of the importance of what the message is how you want your customers to feel the role everyone plays in delivering it leaders must be excellent coaches, guides and counsellors. They must be constantly supporting their people in their ability to deliver the desired experience. Measurement is, in my opinion, one of the most important competencies of all, not just when it comes to customer experience, but when it comes to managing an organisation. I, are you, as a leader, measuring the right things? Are you measuring two things, too many things? Are there measures that you could eliminate to enable you to focus on what makes the difference? And empowerment. Empowerment is a word that I have personally found many leaders finding uncomfortable. 
in my simplistic terms, empowerment means giving people the ability to think and act. Have you given your people that ability to think and act in the interests of the customer? These traits are very, very important and they underpin what leaders need if they want to become truly customer centric leaders. And the most customer centric leaders in the world live and breathe these attributes. The leader that I talk about more than any other at the moment is the CEO of Microsoft, a man called Satya Nadella. He is a truly people centric leader. And one of his mantras at the moment is that he wants to turn Microsoft from a company that knows everything into a company that learns everything. He knows that a leader never stops learning and he believes in the importance of his people's ability to do what is right. So with that in mind, I have an exercise for you. What I would like you to just spend a few minutes thinking about, and I'm going to allow you five minutes to do this, which you may want to combine with a comfort break if you require one, is to think about the attributes on the screen in front of you. Either think about these from your own personal perspective or the perspective of your leadership group, your leadership team in your own organization. How would you score yourself or the leadership team on a scale from one to 10? If you think that your leaders are doing a phenomenal job, you would score or a 10 for each of these. If you think there is room for improvement, you would score less than 10. I will obviously not ask anyone um, on the webinar to share their scores, but if you are comfortable in sharing your perspective on this exercise, then I'd be very, very happy for you to do so. So I'm just going to ask you to spend five minutes of reflection on this exercise before I then continue. Hello everyone, I am back. Um, I hope that you have had the opportunity to review the assessment in front of you and or take a comfort break at the same time. Um, as I say, I don't expect anyone to share the results of what they have just done with me. However, should you want to talk more about this or the second assessment that we are going to come up to do, then please do reach out to me um, on LinkedIn or via email and I'll be very happy to discuss it further with you. What I can share with you is that typically when I conduct this exercise with leadership teams, which in the normal world that we used to live in, I would do in person, it is very, very common for the collective leadership team to come to the realization that they are much closer to a one than they are to a 10 on this scale. This exercise is very effective in getting leaders to wake up and smell the coffee and realize that there are many things as leaders that they are not doing. And so this is extremely important as an exercise if you want to start convincing leaders of the need to change. So let's move on. So we know how important leaders are in making this happen, but what needs to be in place to enable customer centric transformation to become a reality? Around the world, I am asked many questions, especially by leaders. And a question that most leaders will ask me 
do I need a framework to manage the customer experience? And as you can see on the screen, there is only one answer to that question. Yes. Without a structured, rigorous approach to customer experience, the ability to sustain a focus on it will be minimal. We live in a business environment where in normal times, getting people to focus on the customer experience is challenging. Without a framework in place, maintaining the focus on customer experience will become even more difficult, if not impossible. It is critical to have a framework. The problem is that there is no one way of rigorous approach to managing the experience. What you see in front of you is an example of a customer experience framework. This is a form of framework created by Forrester that is known as a maturity model. Customer experience maturity models are the most commonly used form of framework in the world today. What Forrester have said in creating this model is that for an organization to become sustainably customer centric, they must be mature in their application of these six disciplines. Some organizations call these competencies, Forrester call them disciplines. And what Forrester is saying is that these disciplines must be in place to a point where they are happening systematically. In other words, they are, have embedded themselves into the way the organization works, so they happen automatically. There is no need for a customer experience professional to have to push really hard to make these things happen. These disciplines live and breathe. Many organizations, when they look at a model like this for the first time, a framework like this for the first time, come to the realization that much of what they are doing is ad hoc. It happens from time to time. There may be occasions where it doesn't happen at all. This form of framework is very simple and essentially it is also measurable and it is as good a model as any other. But I want to share an even simpler example with you. But before I do, I can see a couple of questions have been asked. So I just want to answer those questions before I continue. Um, so a question from Priscilla. Uh, it would be interesting to share the questionnaire with employees too. Um, would the questionnaire with employees as well so we can identify how our people see our company? Absolutely. Um, I obviously would only do so with the agreement of senior leaders, but you know, ultimately there will be no better judge of leadership than from employees. So absolutely, Priscilla, and thank you for asking that question. Um, and another question from Farage, um, are we going to share the presentation with you? Yes. Um, so we will uh, share the presentation uh, with you afterwards. So please don't worry about that. Please do keep your questions coming. I will see them coming in and I will pause at the appropriate point to answer them. So coming back to the uh, uh, question about structure and rigor. As I say, there is no one way of doing this, but um, what I want to share with you is an even simpler example of a framework that explains why having a structured approach to this is so important. This is a generic framework 
that I created a number of years ago to share knowledge on the subject of customer experience with people all around the world. As you can see, it has three parts to it, strategy, measurement and people. The reason why these parts are displayed as pieces of a jigsaw is because a jigsaw puzzle is the perfect analogy for customer experience. It is the perfect analogy for a few reasons. Firstly, to create a jigsaw, you need to know if you have all of the pieces. There is nothing more frustrating than trying to create a jigsaw puzzle and discovering that there are pieces missing. It is also important as an analogy because just having those pieces is not enough. It is only when you're able to connect the pieces together that you will end up seeing the picture, the picture of what you want the experience to be. Many organizations do have pieces of the puzzle, but they're not connecting them together. And then the final reason for the jigsaw analogy is that when it comes to building a jigsaw, there is no one place to start. If I gave all of you the same jigsaw puzzle, in principle, you would all start with a different piece because there is no one way to start. Every organization is completely different. And so this analogy is a very simple one to hopefully enable you to determine whether or not you have the pieces and are able to put them together. If I just talk you through the framework in a little bit more detail, the first part of the framework I call strategy. It is essentially three questions, three very simple questions in principle. Do you know who the customer is? Do you know what you want their experience to be? And does everyone in your organization know the role they play in delivering that experience? Whilst these are three, in principle, very simple questions, you probably do not need me to tell you that most organizations find it difficult to answer them. Many organizations cannot describe who their customer is. It is amazing how few have actually defined what they want the experience to be. In other words, they do not have a customer experience strategy. And if you do not have a customer experience strategy, you haven't defined what you want the experience to be. How can you expect your people to know what it is that they should be doing to deliver an experience you've never defined. I'm being intentionally brutal in the way I'm describing this, but the reality is most cannot answer those questions. And that makes it extremely difficult when you get to the second part of the framework, the bit I call measurement or the facts. In other words, how good are you at delivering the first part of the framework? This is where the customer journey comes in, because it is the customer journey, whether a business knows it or not, that is bringing the experience to life for your customer right now. This part of the framework I call measurement, because customer experience is a fact based methodology, and it is all about understanding the facts behind that customer journey that we need to focus on to become ever better at delivering the experience we want our customers to have. The measurement part of the framework is concerned with the adoption of what I call an approach to customer journey management. Customer journey management is a cycle of interconnected activities. Those activities being knowing who your customers are in the first place. That comes from the first part of the framework. 
If we know who the customer is, we then need to know what their journey looks like. When we know what their journey looks like, we need to measure it to identify the small number of priorities having the greatest detrimental effect on customer perception and financial performance. And when we know what the priorities are, we then need to fix them. And when we fix them, we go through that cycle and around that cycle all over again and all over again and all over again forever. It is amazing how many companies have mapped the customer journey once and never done anything with it. Many organizations have been measuring the experience for years, but they don't know what the customer journey looks like. There are organizations who know what their priorities are, but they never fix them. It is only when we create that cycle that we are actively managing the experience. But you'll be pleased to see that there is a third part of the framework. The third part of the framework being about people. Because you cannot deliver the experience without people. And this part of the framework is all about creating that environment, that culture that enables your people to think and act in the interests of the customer every time you do anything. This form of framework is incredibly simple and can be applied to any organization anywhere in the world. Um, that has come in from Dua. Uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Dua. Please apologize if I'm not. Um, the question is, after defining the 2B and target journey, how can we create the measurement metrics? So um, if I just adapt the wording of the question slightly, um, how should we be measuring the journey? As I've already said, customer experience measurement is, in my opinion, one of the most important competencies of all when it comes to this subject. And when we know what the journey looks like, robust measurement is concerned with capturing and acting on three voices of measurement. The voice of the customer is all about determining customer perception of the end-to-end -end journey in its current state, the as-is, or the target, as you've described, Dua. VOE, which is all about a uh, voice of the employee, which is all about capturing employee perception of the journey as it is today. And VOP, or voice of the process, which is all concerned with capturing how capable your operational processes are at delivering touch points in the journey. In other words, measuring your operational KPIs in alignment with the journey. Customer experience measurement is vital and it's something that I go into in a lot more detail during my masterclass, which you may be interested in attending. Um, another question, what if the management priority is different than customer priority since they don't believe CX can drive revenue? Um, it is a very common question for me to be asked, words to that effect. Um, the way that I would uh, address management, if they are not believing of the financial effect in focusing on customer experience, is to educate them in understanding that the return for focusing on customer experience is actually in three parts. Revenue generation is one of those parts, but revenue generation is the long term return for focusing on customer experience. It will not happen in six months. It will not happen by clicking your fingers. It's the long term benefit. The other two forms of return are cost reduction and cost avoidance. Those two 
returns for focusing on customer experience can happen immediately in the short term. Those are the immediate ways of delivering benefit in simplistic terms by eliminating the randomness in the experience, by stopping the things that are going wrong, by avoiding unnecessary contact, your organization will save money immediately. Not enough leaders, managers, recognize that customer experience is as much about taking cost out as it is putting the experience in. And so if we want to get customer experience on their agenda, on their radar, we need them to understand the cost benefit of doing so in the immediate and the short term. I hope that addresses uh, the two questions that have been asked so far. So I want to just reiterate that as a leader, we need to know the role we play in delivering customer centric organizations what um, form of rigor structure is required to make the management of the experience intentional and sustainable so that being said i want to take it to another level of detail another level of detail that leaders within an organization need to understand sit behind the detail of the framework because if we are going to become sustainably customer centric where we are on the receiving end of not just the cost return but also the revenue return we need to understand whether or not our organization on the inside has the right level of competency capability to make it happen eight years ago when i became an independent specialist in customer experience i developed a maturity model of my own a maturity model that contained 10 customer centric competencies the 10 competencies that you see on the screen in front of you for an organization to consider itself to be sustainably customer centric they would need to be comfortable that they are mature in their adoption and understanding of these 10 competencies let's go through them one by one proposition clarity of brand proposition essentially means is there a clear understanding of why your organization exists and the experience that you want your customers to have this is all about essentially determining whether or not you have a defined and adopted customer experience strategy readiness is your organization even ready to become customer centric are there people within your organization who question why are we even talking about this we're customer centric already we don't need any of this if there is even a sense of denial of avoidance of we don't need to do this then there is an issue with readiness the customer journey as we've touched on a couple of times already today whether an organization knows it or not the customer journey already exists your customers have been experiencing a journey since the day you were created but does your business know what the journey looks like do they know what works or what doesn't work in that journey are decisions being made aligned to the customer journey effort how easy is it for your customers to interact with you again as i said right at the beginning of this session if there is even a sense 
that it is not easy to interact with you, then that is a problem. Functionality. This comes down to actually your products and services in the first place. Do they work? Do they work in the way your customers need them to? Are there faults or problems that you're aware of? Are there glitches, things that customers don't like? If there is anything about the product or service the customer doesn't like, that is a challenge. And then capability. This is all about process, that process layer that sits underneath the journey, representing the things your people do every day. Are those processes documented? Are they documented and do they have a clear accountability? And are those processes aligned to the customer journey? Emotion. We've already touched on the importance of knowing how you make your customers feel. Do you have an understanding of that? And are your customers today feeling the way you want them to feel? Advocacy. If your people feel the way you want them to feel, and if your organization is able to empathize with your customers and with your employees, then they should become fans of yours. There is a very simple statement that I share during my masterclass, that statement being all about the power of empathy. And that statement reads as follows, Empathy builds advocacy. Advocacy leads to loyalty. Loyalty delivers growth. And that is what most organizations would love to see. Measurement. I've just shared with you how important measurement is as a competency. But does your organization have a good, robust measurement system in place? that is measuring the true end-to-end -end customer journey, that is capturing how the customer feels, how the employee feels, in alignment with understanding how capable your processes are. And the final competency is ROI. Again, as we've just been discussing, does your business understand the return on investment for improving the experience? These 10 competencies define what I like to call the science that customer experience has become. Customer experience is a recognized bona fide profession. And that profession is underpinned by a science. And these competencies define that science. Before we get to the exercise that I'm going to ask you to participate in, we're just going to respond to these questions and then I'm going to share the exercise with you. So first question, after defining the, okay, that question we have answered. Uh, sorry, this is another question. Can I recommend a good system for journey measurement, please? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by a system. Um, uh, I will uh, interpret, I think, what the question means. One of the greatest challenges for customer experience as a profession is that there is no one way of doing it. And so when it comes to measuring the experience, um, there are a number of different things that can be done. With regards voice of the customer, voice of the customer is an essential mechanism, um, but again, there is no one way of measuring it. The most commonly used measurement system for VOC in the world today is NPS or Net Promoter Score. Um, it is the most commonly used largely because it is very simple because it's based on one question, would you recommend? Um, just because it's the most used does not mean it is the best. 
The other commonly used mechanisms are customer satisfaction or CSAT. Um, increasingly, more organizations are measuring customer effort or customer effort score, but there are other mechanisms. There is now a customer happiness index. There is an organization that measures customer value. Um, there is a, another mechanism uh, that measures uh, whether or not the experience is worth it for the customer. So there are a number of things. In terms of would I recommend any of those measurement systems, um, the answer to that question is uh, not directly. Uh, indirectly, maybe, because the only way I would make a suggestion as to the right way of measuring the experience is if I can understand the situation. Um, it sounds like a very consulting answer to the question, but unless I know the circumstances, uh, it is difficult for me to make the right suggestion. What I will say is that the rule of thumb when it comes to measuring VOC is the more the merrier. In other words, never rely on one mechanism alone. If possible, there's no reason why you shouldn't be measuring NPS, customer effort, and others all at the same time, drawing a conclusion from their collective intelligence. Again, I hope that helps. If you want to understand more, then reach out to me. I've just had some more clarification. Uh, a platform to... Ah, okay. So again, the question is more about... Um, uh, related to uh, a software platform to measure the experience. Again, it does depend. Um, the companies that you have mentioned are good. Uh, there are others as well, but it depends on the, the size and scale of your organization, um, the line of business of your organization as to which of them might be more appropriate because they all have pros and cons. So what I would suggest to the, uh, the person asking the question is reach out to me on LinkedIn or via email. Um, and if you're able to share a bit more context with me, I'll then give you my guidance as to where I think you should probably go. I hope that's okay. So what I would now like you to do is perform a very important um, assessment. A very important assessment which I just want to give you a little bit of context on before I share it. The model I'm going to share with you I have personally used many times myself to independently assess organizations around the world. I have also asked countless leadership teams to self-assess in a workshop environment like this. So what I'm sharing with you is a proven maturity model that has been effective in enabling many organizations around the world to plan their transformation. The model looks like this. Each of the 10 that I walked you through are scored on a scale from one to 10. If an organization was perfect in its adoption of all 10 competencies, the total score would be 100. Where I have independently assessed an organization, I typically tend to see a score, a total score, between 35 and 45. On two occasions, I have seen a score lower than 20. A score lower than 20 is a very significant concern. For me to consider an organization to be sustainably customer centric, I would need to see a score in excess of 80. So what I would like you to do is this. Spend, and I'm going to give you 10 minutes to review this because this is an exercise that requires some thought. I'd like you to go through each one of these competencies 
and determine where you think your organization is today. It is critical to be completely honest and open with yourself. There is no benefit to um, being uh, generous with the score and then calculate your total score. As with the previous exercise, I am not expecting you to share your score with me. But what would be useful is if anyone is comfortable in sharing their thoughts on the exercise. Many people will tell me that this is eye opening, for example, um, that it is uh, uh, tough to experience. It, it's words like that that I'd be interested for you to share. If you have any questions as you're doing it, please don't hesitate to ask. But I will reconnect um, uh, uh, the webinar. Now, I'm not going to disconnect it, but I will come back in in 10 minutes at half past the hour. I thought I would share some additional insights with you about the model and the way the model has been used in practice because it is um, uh, such an important tool to establish an understanding of the need to transform in the first place and then in driving that transformation forward. Um, typically, when uh, either as a self-assessment or if this is used by my team to independently assess, there are two of these competencies that consistently will score lower than any other. Those two being the last two, measurement and return on investment. Very, very common for those two to score a one or a two even. Um, additionally, it is not uncommon for the first one proposition to score below a five. But in reality, as I say, or as I said before I set the exercise up, typically I see a score between 35 and 45. Um, that is not the end of the world. Um, it sounds quite um, a stark score um, to realise, but in reality, it, it is just a reflection of fact. Increasing the score from 30 to 40 to beyond 50 does not have to be too challenging or too difficult. Um, one of the reasons that many score below that is because there is no strategy and there is no understanding of the journey. Just by putting those two competencies in place, automatically the score starts to improve quite rapidly. It is not uncommon for me to assess an organisation for the first time, to see a score of 35 to 45, and then to reassess in a year's time and see the score rising to anywhere between 55 and 65. That is not uncommon. However, I must make it very clear that sustaining the score is as important as um, improving it. It is not uncommon for an organization to improve the score, to then take their foot off the gas and see the score go backwards again. To get a score that is above beyond 80 and stays beyond 80 is extremely challenging and requires the adoption of a framework that I discussed earlier during this session. It is the adoption of that rigor that will see you improve incrementally, incrementally and sustainably. In addition to the framework, it is also vital to have the right level of accountability and governance. As I've said throughout this session, if there is anything that it has raised in your mind that you would like to discuss more, it concerns you, 
you don't understand it, you must reach out to me. Please do not hesitate to email me, to connect with me on LinkedIn, whatever you prefer. Um, if you need support, I and the Arquette Global team will support you in whatever way you need. Additionally, I do go into far more depth on all of the competencies during my masterclasses. If you want more information about the masterclass, please do not hesitate to connect with the Arquette Global team, who again will give you all the information you need. I'm going to be running the masterclass in a number of different time zones. So if you want that information, you want that guidance, that guidance is there. Everything I'm sharing with you, I'm sharing with you in the spirit of sharing knowledge so you can use this knowledge yourselves. And so just to reiterate, I will be, well, I say I, I will be giving this material to the Arquette Global team to share with you via um, email. So you will receive a PDF of the slides that I've used today by email shortly. If there is anything else, please don't hesitate to reach out, but I shall pass back to um, Mark at the Arquette Global team to uh, just see if there are any questions and to close off. But I, I think everyone is being very uh, polite today and not asking questions, so I would not be surprised if there aren't any. But Mark, I'll just hand back to you. Thank you very much, Ian. That was incredibly insightful. Um, and are there any final questions for, for Ian and for me? Okay, I, I think that's it for today. But as Ian said, we will be sharing these slides afterwards and we will also be posting this video on our Arquette Global YouTube channel. So uh, thank you very much for all of you for attending today. And Ian, thank you very much. That was excellent. Thank you, everyone. Have a good uh, afternoon, evening, morning, wherever you happen to be.